speaker for this session is Dr. Alon Kaufman. He's the director of uh, research and innovation in RSA and is also leading large-scale data science uh, project. Okay, thanks uh, Leo for the introduction and thank you everyone in the audience that managed to survive until this uh, time on Thursday. Uh, thank you everyone. In order to keep you a little bit awake, we're going to talk about three things today which are hopefully is relevant. We're going to talk about money, we're going to talk about crime, and we're going to talk about data mining which I hope is suitable for this audience. Um, so as we all presented, we... sorry. I'm Alon Kaufman, I lead the research and innovation in RSA, uh, as well as part of the EMC. RSA is a company part of EMC, and I also lead the data science activities of EMC in Israel. And um, to your question about systems that can log information and so on, uh, approach me afterwards, because I also do some sales sometimes. So what I want to talk today is, first of all, present a little bit what, what our team does and what the group does and basically focus on something that I think was emerging the whole day, and that's the difference between the academic side of data mining and the business side of data mining. And actually talk about practical data mining. How do you bring products, revenue generating products, based on data mining to the market? And we have done so in EMC, and specifically in RSA, we have a set of products which are based on machine learning and data mining that are out in the market for several years, many, many customers, Easy to measure ROI, I'm going to show, so talk a lot, a lot about it today. Um, and the experience of how do you take data mining and algorithms and make out of them projects is what I want to talk today. And there is a difference between how academic world uh, deals with data mining versus the industry. Uh, we preliminarily deal with security, financial security, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we deal with cyber crime and APTs like uh, you guys spoke about, and also other elements uh, in the um, general IT security and data mining. But the bottom goal is that we constantly seek to bring an end-to-end -end solution based on these tools. And not only prove that algorithms can work, but basically have solutions in place with proven ROI. So, help me wake up. To what fields can we actually apply data mining in a practical way? So there were many mentioned today. Please, each say his favorite um, field. What fields could you apply data mining to? Marketing, great. What else? Security. Anyone for retail? Healthcare. No? And sell. Sure. So I think we all uh, believe that it can be basically applied to anything. I, I teach a course in a different university, so I won't mention the name. That I give the students a, a, a task over a normal weekend paper to come up with projects that how can data mining help businesses. And Really, the, the ideas are endless. So what is the problem, actually, and what is the challenge of applying data mining to these business things? Because you don't see too many real products, big products, based on data mining out there. So what would be the main product, problem or challenge in applying these methods? Getting data. Great. So definitely data, getting data is one. But besides the data. Understand the domain. Why do you understand the domain? Otherwise, can't the job. So, from my experience, it's these three letters, which are internal investment. I think the place where we have the most problem today in convincing and building data mining applications is the ability to prove the return on investment. And it's beyond, definitely you need the data and, and so on and so forth, but Think each of you on projects that you had in mind or that you ever done. Could you easily convey the uh, return on investment? And this happens before two reasons. A, it's us to blame as the data mining people that we don't know how to explain it. And B, many times the business doesn't understand the value. And get, uh, bridging this gap and solving the solutions or the business problems with data mining that can show this ROI right is definitely key. 
And um, this is what I want to talk about today and give the fraud as a, one example for this. So I hope you'll all agree with me, although it is a little bit uh, funny in this stomach. A good data mining or bringing uh, revenue generating products to the market is way beyond the algorithm. And I think you've all seen this um, um, data mining cycle, the Chris, the Chris Industry data mining cycle. And by and large, I really believe that this is the right process and each one has its own variants, but we are talking about understanding the business problem, getting the data, feature generation, feature selection, modeling, measuring, and so on and so forth. And um, typically, the understanding the business problem is where many of these problems lack. So that's the key. It, it's not it's a, on purpose, everything starts there, and it's an iterative wheel. But in many, many cases, we miss this. And the reason why we miss it is because the data mining people are not really the business experts. And they don't talk, talk the language as the business experts. So from our experience in many, many verticals, this is the main key. Really understand what are the business problems. What are the drives there? What is the compliance there? What is the regulations there? What is the main, all the business aspects of even beyond the specific uh, problem. And then, of course, it's the deployment. So you may have an excellent algorithm, but can it be deployed in a manageable way? So I can assure you, I'm going to talk about fraud detection today. And uh, I think already 25 years, maybe fraud detection is one of the classical examples in data mining. And I can assure you, if I give you some of our data, which has transactions and markings for fraud and genuine, and you give this to your students, or you take this as a project, you can get excellent fraud detection results. But in deploying this and making out of a product that works in real time in banks is way beyond that, and it's a lot to do with deployment as well. And these are the sides I want to really emphasize today. Goes without saying, you need data, you need modeling, and so on. So if your model is worth nothing, nothing will work. But I think in many, many cases, um, the more academic side of the world, which is more comfortable, is to take and model the data and bring great F measures and compare methods and show which of them has the higher accuracy. And in order to bring this to a real production of the product, uh, there's much more to do. The way we typically work to solve this problem is that in any new domain we go into, in any new business, we have teams based on three types of people or three types of understanding. One is the business understanding, what we call the domain expert. In many cases, we grow it internally when we go into new segments. And if not, we work very closely with the customers. The second is, of course, the data mining, the data expert, which without the person that knows which data, how to access the data, the regulation of the data, the PII, the information, personalization, whatever is critical. And then comes, of course, the model that has to understand and actually combine these two things. Understand the business problem, understand what data you have, and be able to really apply the modeling. Um, I'm talking from experience basically in all of these fields we've been operating and in all of, all of them, uh, and I'm sure you've seen several examples, the, the, the key is really the same cycle, working the cycle and working according to these three things. Business understanding and only after that really uh, the modeling and deployment. So, Enough background, I'll give you the full example which I hope will convey your, uh, my ideas. So, let's just, each of us, stop a minute and imagine the following. So you finally get out of this conference today, you get home, you put your child, your children to sleep, whatever, and then you just see your shopping list on the fridge, and you say, well, the heck of it, let's go and do shopping today, and you go to your supermarket, you, you collect all your products and so on, you come to pay, and your credit card hasn't passed. And you try again and a credit card doesn't pass. And you use your other credit card and it's rejected. And you're left with all your products and your credit cards are not working. So if you're lucky, you find a friend that bails you out or you throw everything you left with your milk and, uh, and bread and you pay with some cash, you run home to see what's happening. You go into your bank account, you see that your account is blocked and you have a huge minus of 15,000 shekels, which is your maximum limit. But you remember that just last week you actually deposited 10,000 shekel from your uncle. So you start looking what's happening there, and you basically see yes, you deposited this 10,000 shekel last week, but since then 
There were some other activities that you actually didn't do. Someone got into your account, sold some shares for 30,000 shekel, opened the new payee, a payee is the account you pay to, opened the new payee, transferred 50,000 shekel today, which is the maximum your bank allows. Now you're in a minus of minus 10, and your bank account is clocked. And it's Thursday night. So what do you do? Okay, so you're waiting until Friday morning. Hopefully your bank will uh, answer you. You call the bank and then it says to me, well, mister, we have authenticated you all the time. The first time you sold shares, great. That's typical. Then you added a new pay. We actually asked you from what school you came and what was the name of your pet and your mother's maiden name and all those questions and you answered them. And then when you actually transferred 50,000 shekels, we even asked, we even sent you an SMS and you replied with a message. So what are you talking about? These scenarios are typical scenarios of uh, fraud in banks today. These falsers manage to get over all the measures, or basically many of the measures that banks have been deployed, and such scenarios are becoming more and more common. Um, the world of fraud is even more advanced than the world of cybercrime. There are conferences like this that are even in bigger rooms and uh, with highly, highly technical capabilities. It's a very, very well-organized network of crime, and basically it's divided in the following way. There are fraudsters or people that build tools in order to do these things, in order to steal credentials, in order to steal all authentication uh, information, in order to get your account details and so on. And then there's operational sites which helps you monetize on this. In the small example I gave you, someone had to steal your credentials. This is done by normal phishing sites and so on. And then someone had to also have the ability to monetize it. Because if you as a fraudster get my account details and have all my authentication information, it's great. But if you send the money to your brother, they'll probably find you. So you also have to know how to send out the money in a way that they won't catch you. And for example, that's what exactly Mule's account are. So today, if you want to commit crime, which is very, very highly sophisticated, it's not so complex because you can just go and buy the services. You can buy some credentials, you can buy some operational services to, to monetize it, and, and bingo, you're done. For example, this is an, um, a shop to uh, selling credit cards. So if you look here, you can see there's a um, you can see the number of the credit card. You can't see actually, but I'll tell you. So you see some details of the credit card, from what country it is, from what city it is, and so on. And here is the price. So basically you can go and you pick the bank you prefer, the city you prefer, the country you prefer, and for a, a, a price ranging from $35 to $15, you've, you've got a credit card. And now you can go and do your shopping. And if you buy an iPad for this and you pay $35, it's quite a good return on investment for the fraud. Um, you want to do some online banking fraud? This is, again, a forum that's communicating between the guys that collect their, their credentials and the guys that are trying to monetize it. And what you see here is basically a bargaining. I'll read it out to you. Um, one of the guys says, well, I have a good Western Union job. My share is only 25% and blah, 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 blah. Meaning, uh, we're in Western, you know, is uh, the, the banking accounts which are brick and mortar. And he says, well, if you, I'll send you, I'll, I'll help you get out your money, and I'll take only 25% of the share. And then you see uh, a guy named Sunny answer, uh, answering him, well, I'm a good Western Union drop. My share is only 20%. The other guy is a drop from the US. Don't trust American people, blah, blah, blah. And then I go on, I go on. And then it comes down to 15% and so on. These kinds of communications is a free market, and this is just a more uh, heuristic one, but there's a communication between these groups. Some people professionalizing collecting information, some people professionalizing selling the services, hosting services and so on, and others uh, professionalizing ready monetization. And there's a huge network include bulletproof hosting services that you can't get onto these uh, uh, networks and so on that are actually making this ecosystem of fraud work and tons of money is running through it. Let's give this example. So um, 
in, in, in practice, what Zulunia yeah, is, you know, you can do this just as easy, just as easily online. And to do really commit fraud today, it's much, much more, it's not very risky, and it's much more easier than really um, doing it physically. And the revenues that they generate are amazing. So no matter what banks will do, they'll always overcome you. And that's where we start to come in with our solutions. So why I tell you all of this? Because I want to start to go to the thing that you really have to understand your business in order to solve it. So talking about fraud detection solutions in banks, and this is one of the parts we do, let's see what are their drivers. So obviously the first driver here is to stop the fraud, prevent the fraud. Now, in, in this case, when it's money fraud, it's very, very easy to measure ROI. So in this case, it's very easy. It's fraud that you prevented, you actually saved. And if you prevented a transaction that wasn't fraudulent, you actually lost that transaction, whatever. But beyond that, usability is key. So any bank or any merchant or e any e-commerce company wants to, of course, minimize the interaction the user has. How many of you have ever been on an e-commerce site, started to, to buy something, had to fill in all these personalized data and start to give you all your details and say, well, you know what, the heck of it, I won't do it. Um, users don't have much tolerance for all the security issue. So maybe, I don't know, you mentioned 5% maybe are, but most, percent, most people really don't have the tolerance, and banks and e-commerce companies are very, very concerned about that. So you can't really bother people too much with security. On the other hand, also for our customers, the banks, total cost of ownership and usability is key for them as well. So they have a fraud group that has to deal with all this fraud. And each time a fraud case comes in, they have to call the customer and check its fraud. And if it is fraud, there's a whole series of legal activities that he has to do. So your solution has to take that into account. If your bank has only 10 people dealing with fraud, you might as well bring them only enough cases to deal with that A, the fraud team won't be unemployed, or B, that they won't, the fraud team won't have too many cases and can't deal with. So these are elements you have to take into account. What does the customer do with your output? The third thing is interpret, interpretability. So if you have an excellent engine with the highest accuracy that really shoots out fraud, not fraud, and it's a black box, this is not good enough as either. Because if the re relatively uneducated person or not a proficient person has to do these fraud calls in order to identify and talk to the customer, he needs to understand why is he calling this guy. It's not enough for him to say, well, was that a fraud transaction? He has to um, ask some questions and understand why it's been suspicious. So your models don't have to only be um, accurate, they also have to be explainable and interpretable many times instead of accuracy or on top of accuracy. And then another key thing is the dynamic world of fraud. And there was an interesting question here that, uh, it was, that I think you asked Yuval Elovich and he answered you, how we can overcome uh, the, the, these effects. What happens in this world of cybercrime and fraud is any solution that comes up depends on the complexity of the solution, but it's compromised between seconds after it came up to days. So any solution you bring out there, there's enough money in the market in the fraud thing to analyze your system and see how you overcome it. Sometimes they even know ahead of time what your plans are, and once you go out, bingo, they're there. Um, so any solution you have has to be dynamic by nature. Even if you've solved the problem excellently today, if you deploy it, tomorrow it's not gonna be valid anymore. And of course, you have to deal with this full uh, fraud chain. And the, the, the way we actually deal with it is that you can't really try and prevent all this chain of collection credentials and harvesting them and, and avoiding them. And you really have to go and shoot for one point, which is the cash out. You have to go to the one, maybe not the weakest link, but the last link there, and stop at the cash out. Because the only thing that fraudster is really going to be doing, that you'll always be able to differentiate between the general user and the fraud user, is at the cash out. The fraudster won't transfer money to my mother, and he won't buy me a laptop. He'll transfer money to someone else, and he's going to buy something and not send it to my address. And this is what the key where it always happens. Uh, complex malware and so on will emulate your computer, steal all your authentication methods, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it will move the money to somewhere where you typically wouldn't move it, 
and that's where we focus. So how do our solutions look? It goes the following way. We take the user transactions, which is the online banking transaction or the e-commerce transaction. We enter this into a machine learning based risk engine and enhance this with additional information. Historical profiles, information about the device, external feeds, we have fraud feeds and so on. So you take as much as information as possible on the user. A risk engine shoots out a score basically between a zero to 1,000, which 1,000 is the higher probability for it to be fraud, the most riskiness. Now, if the transaction got a low score, like in this example, 271, it basically goes through seamlessly. So the user doesn't know anything's happening, he moves his money or he buys his, uh, his, his, his goods, and he's just invisibly authenticated, and everything goes through um, clearly. However, if it turns out to be risky based on our models, then, and only then, we now require him to authenticate himself. So uh, we can use any kind of authentication method. You can use here, you can start asking the secret questions here. You can use SMS and, and any other method you want. If the user pauses this, great. He's, he's through again. If he fails this, so uh, we feed it back to our engine learning that the probability of this guy to be a fraudster is higher. And then we also send it to a human analyst, which analyzes the case and feeds back into our system if it was really fraud or not fraud. So this is the way our systems work. They're working online. And, and um, if you can see this model answers the following things. A, it really provi it provides the usability we want to talk about, and we'll see some numbers soon. The feedback loops here, they are constantly learning what is normal, what is not normal, what is foreignness, what is not foreignness, helps us to keep dynamic and not really a, a static model that is overcome. And uh, the way that this is deployed is that we control the risk score that goes from one, 0 to 1,000 is actually, it's not a classifier, it's a rank prioritized list, and we can control the number of cases we open every day. So if you are a bank and you prepare to treat 100 cases a day, we will provide you the most 100 risky cases you want. And if you can prepare to deal with 50 or 20 or 1,000, we, we, the customer can adjust it, and on top of this puts his policies. And uh, the ability to do this in real time and in a hosted solution that allows us also to monitor this is really what provides our customers with, with the ability to work with us and constantly improve their fraud detection. We can't talk about it without showing some numbers. So here you see some numbers about online banking. For example, in this case, we can uh, we prevented 91% of all the fraud. Um, 1.3 million dollars in this case in that month, and the challenge rate of only 0.35%. Meaning only 0.35% of the cases we actually triggered, and this saved 91% of the fraud. So obviously the more the, the lower your the, the higher your change rate is, obviously your fraud detection is, is high. But these numbers, anything below uh, half a percent is is actually quite acceptable in this industry. In e-commerce, the numbers are even a bit higher. You can see here 99% detection and a ratio of false positives from one, uh, 0 0.3. Um, I skip the details of, of how this engine works. But what we actually do, sorry, what we actually, with these systems, we uh, prevent beyond $4 billion annually of fraud, both in the online banking and e-commerce system, and the number is constantly growing. Um, good for us, bad for us, I don't know, well, depends how you look at the, the, the world. The special things about this uh, engine, and that's why I gave the big, the long uh, background, is the ability for it, um, for us to learn, since we have a hosted solution, we have all the banking transactions and fraud markings on them. And we have, by the way, all cases, we have the true positives, the true negative, the false positives, the false negatives. So we have an excellent research environment to work on because it's a hosted solution. Um, we have fraud analysts that understand how Trojans work, understand how the underground works and so on. So we have a deep understanding on the fraud side and we work with our customers, the bank, to really see their side. The feedback mechanisms we put in here, which are part of the, of the products, allows us to constantly adapt to the new 
um, fraud that constantly emerges and you can really see it. If you stop the learning for one month, you already see it declining. I'm finishing. I can't talk, uh, finish my talk without talking about big data these days. Um, I hope you're familiar with this uh, Gartner metrics talking about uh, big data. It just gives some kind of measure of the complexity. Um, these are the magnitudes of our system. So when you come up with your algorithms, they also have to work in the scale you want. We're talking about, um, you, can, you can see the numbers, but during this lecture and the oral stand on your time, we're talking about 600,000 transactions that our system has just treated. You saw the amounts of fraud. Uh, we deal with about 500 transactions per second, uh, 140 features in each of our models, and all of this is doing online, self-online machine learning um, algorithms applied to this. And this by itself is a challenge as well which costs money, and this is part of the ROI, of course, also modeling this. So, um, I'll just summarize and then we'll offer for questions. Um, my main key message here, and from, from many verticals, and I think the fraud one is, is basically the most simple one to show, in order to build products in the market that pay, are based on machine learning and data mining capabilities, algorithms are important, the data is important, but you have to understand the business problem and have to take into account deployment elements, the uh, compliance elements, and so on. And that's why we really, uh, the golden triangle we work with in all of the segments, in the same methodology, is based on these three uh, keys. The business side, the data side, and the modeling side. And. Um, we in EMC provide this. I, what I have to say to you is when we come into customers that we don't understand their business and they don't understand us, we even we, we offer a, um, a workshop where we sit down with the business people and the, and the data people and really go through their data, their challenges, and together uh, in a significant long time start to understand and, and talk the same language until we really identify the right problem, the right measurement, the right deployment point mode and that um, from our experience in many many cases is one of the keys to advance in this field. Any questions? Uh, I want to ask about deployment because I'm not sure I understand how you do it. When you deploy your product in a bank or in a, uh, in a company, a, a retail company, uh, your model, your learning algorithm is there. When the environment, when things start to change, when the users, the fraud, you, uh, the, the criminals learn your systems uh, will start to change their behavior, you have to change the model. Now, what what happens? I mean, you need you know your expertise is in house. Let's say in Israel, so you must get the transactions in Israel. But you have they have there are privacy concerns. A bank in Germany will not send you the transactions to Israel. So I'm not sure how this is done. So the first levels. Uh, thank you for the question. The practical level is our solution is a hosted solution. And we have also services in the right countries. So sometimes in Europe, they're not prepared to send to the US or first by. So the technical side is that we have data centers in the right geographies to allow regulations. And of course, the PCI compliant and so on. In Israel, we just have the brains building these models. And the, the, the reason I emphasize these feedback loops is that these models learn on the go. We don't choose them daily. You, you, this is, this is what a field is called online machine learning. Every time we made the right decision, we give we strengthen our model. Every time we made the wrong decision, we understand that we missed it. Every time a customer adds, and this is a huge privilege in the financial world, every time we miss fraud, the real customer, the end user, will phone the bank and say, hey, there was fraud here. We get that. So we really live in an ideal world for, for machine learning people. Yes, yeah, so we have all the examples, and you won't have this in all worlds, but here we leverage this, and the model constantly learns. So the customer will buy another box based on the previous customers, and it starts immediately to adapt to his environment. And the technicality is that, yes, the, 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 data, the data centers are deployed in the right geographies in order to set with compliance. Uh, 
what is the role of uh, expert in in this cycle? Uh, is he uh, structures as a, a anomaly patterns by himself, or, or you are learning them from from the data? The, the, what is the role of the expert here? Yes. Which expert? The domain expert. Domain expert. Yes. So, so there's there's two aspects to the domain expert. Um, one is basically, um, and I think that the one you're focusing more is how does the expert help in the modeling, not in the solution, um, choosing the features. Understanding how the fraud works and what features have to be taken into account is what we get from these domain experts mainly. So you can do theoretically, you know, expand all the features and do the feature selection. We focus on them and we focus on the relevant features first from the experts, which bring us like around 80 features that we should look in. And then we do the, of course, the expansion and feature selection and feature generation. But the initial understanding how fraud is done and what are the uh, predictors or features we should look at come from the domain expert. The other side of the domain expert is actually managing the business of the fraud in the bank and then run the policies. So by the way, a transaction can be very, very risky, but it's of three dollars. So when well, it's fraud, but it's not worth to deal with it. By the way, sometimes it is worth to deal with it because if you don't deal with the three dollar ones, you'll suddenly see a million ones of three dollars, so you just lost three million. So there's also business considerations which actually how guys help in, the, in the setting down the policies, but I think your question was really to where the domain expert comes in here, and it comes in in understanding what features you meant to look into and how fraud sell things in order to really overcome these uh, patterns. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my question is about the understanding of the fraudster networks. Do you apply some techniques to understand what uh, types of the frauds were connected and uh, which way? to improve your precision. We, 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 we have, by the way, several different services in RSA, and I didn't talk about them. Some of, uh, you know, to deny phishing accounts, uh, phishing attacks, sorry, re, re, um, re credential recovery, closing down Moodle accounts, Trojan, and so on. And so we have a lot, a lot also in that space. But this solution really avoids all of that and says, well, I assume users are, are uh, compromised. I know that there's credentials out there. I know that force is going to overcome it. Let's look at the behavior pattern and stop it there. And, and regarding the other services and what we do there, uh, I'd be happy to take offline. We have a lot of there as well. And you have to have these in place. But from this angle, I actually just didn't know those parts. <coughs> Uh, I really like the uh, idea of stepping up the authentication uh, as an intermediate phase, but I was wondering in uh, the case of, say, uh, buying online, uh, what exactly is your gold standard? Uh, I mean, if you think that you've prevented 98% of the fraud, for all you know, there is a lot of fraud <laughs> that you never know about. Yes, so we, we did also in the APT world, which, which you have spoke, and that, the problem there there is huge. Here because there's people behind the scenes and it's their wallet, we assume that most of the fraud we know about. Because if someone, yes, we do have people that, you know, any of us, we, someone could steal some money and we wouldn't notice. But if something happens to your bank account significant, or to credit card, you will phone your bank or your, your insurance or whatever, and we get these chargebacks. So we, we bet, you, you, first of all, you're right, but second of all, because there's end users with their money here that report it back to the banks, we assume we, we get most of the, what we call the um, misfraud. In this case, in, in, in I would say 99.9 .9 of the other topics we spoke about, you wouldn't get your false, your misfraud, but here you, you do get them. Thank you very much. <laughs>